All right, good morning. We have made it to the weekend, and I'm um, looking forward to what goes on. For me, sometimes it's just good to be to slow down, and uh, I look forward to that. Uh, today, I'm actually just kind of piddling in my office. Uh, I'm going to clean it up and um, repackage things that have gotten out of place because it's just the hush, and, I mean, the rush of life. And So that's where we find ourselves, And uh, but looking forward to what it has for us. It's going to be rainy, I think, where we are, and uh, those are good days uh, when it's like that. It kind of resets everything, so um, I'm excited about what, what the weekend holds. Hope you are, too, and uh, man, I, some of you are heading to work in just a minute, or some of you are going to be at work by the time you watch this or listen to it or wherever you are, and um, so uh, blessings to all of you. Man, let's jump into First uh, Timothy today, and we're in chapter six, and <clears throat> this is um, Paul is a progression of dealing with topics that are going on in the church in Ephesus, and so he's kind of gunshotting some issues like you would if you were heading off on a journey and you you're telling your kids, giving them last minute instructions if they're old enough to kind of stay by themselves and so you know you say hey do this and do that and make sure you do this watch out for that right you give them those kind of rules this is similar to where Paul is and so today he's uh, broaching the subject of money and uh, and we'll see the context of where that falls in but he gives some incredible insightful truths and understanding so much that I mean there's no way that we could uh, accomplish that here we would be spending uh, a lot of of, uh, days talking about this topic. So uh, we're going to s- try to stick to the text and see what it says. But but uh, Paul has just finished reminding Timothy uh, about the need to instruct and teach and, and what that looks like and to uh, be careful about people who think that godliness is a means of financial gain. And so there is that teaching, and it's prevalent even today uh, in, in our culture, a teaching that said godliness opens up the door for great wealth, right? I mean, that's the whole uh, prosperity doctrine that's, uh, that really has saturated um, our, our, our church culture in so many ways, some subtle, some not so subtle. You've got your charlatans on TV and your uh, men who, who, and women who are teaching simply to, to make a buck. And uh, they're just hypocrites, and they're liars, and their conscience has been seared, and they are uh, they are after an almighty dollar. And it's evil to see uh, what takes place uh, under the guise of church. Uh, but so so Paul is sees that happening in Ephesus, where there is this rush. This is what he says in verse five, and and constant friction between those of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and think that godliness is a means to financial gain. So there is that prosperity doctrine. They've been deprived of the truth, robbed of it, blinded by it, however you want to do it, to think that money then somehow equates to uh, being blessed by God. We we throw that term around a lot, right? Oh, I'm, I'm just blessed. And I know what we mean by that. We don't mean evil by it. But if we slow down to think about what that means, if I'm blessed because I have a new car, does that mean that you're not blessed because you don't have a new car? You see, you see the, the the silliness of these statements that sometimes we make. And, and again, every gift of God is a blessing. So I am not I am not diminishing that at all. I just think it's important that we rethink what we believe to be blessings. And um, so let's lay a few groundworks about money uh, before we jump into this text. Wealth and money is not evil. The scriptures nowhere say that wealth or money is evil. It may and does, in fact, say is a root of all sorts. Not the root, but a root of all sorts of evil. It is a danger, but so is a lot of things. So so is alcohol. So is uh, sexual uh, intimacy and the natural course of what happens in human life. All of those things have great potential for destruction, right? So <clears throat> money is not alone in that opportunity for Satan to seize on it and bring us down. But wealth and money is not evil. Proverbs 8.21 says that the righteous uh, you know, should expect uh, wealth in that sense. Now that's a it's a it's a proverb. It means it's not a it's not a promise, it's a principle that there's something about being a Christ follower 
that gives you these untold uh, wealth, some in financial dollars and some not, because we know very wealthy people, I mean, very solid Christians who have very little money. Uh, but there's there's nothing wrong with it. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't be talked about in a, in a favorable way uh, in the Old Testament and in, in other places as well. Um, God gives us the ability to make wealth, right? So you, you have your wealth. And if you want to think that, you know, you pulled yourself up out of the ashes and you made something great of yourself, uh, that there is a measure of truth in that, that you, you did actually do that. But if you pull the curtain back to see what happened, God gave you the ability to make wealth. That, that at least ought to humble and temper the arrogance that happens among the wealthy, because it is God who gives us the ability to make wealth. That's what Deuteronomy 8 says. It's a sovereign God that we have. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who gave Job the ability to make wealth? God did. Who gave, who gave Job poverty? God did right? So we just have to at least acknowledge some of these groundworks before we jump into this text. How you use your money is the best indicator of where your heart is, right? So it's, listen, if you're, if you're making $10,000 a year, you're making $100,000 a year, uh, you've got a big mansion, you're living in a shack, whatever that is. Wherever, whatever station in life you find yourself with, how you think about money and what you do with the money that you do have is an indication of where your heart is. That's what Jesus was very specific, right? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So you open up your checkbook, <clears throat> you pull out your credit card receipts, you'll see where your love is, right? And so it's important that we kind of get these groundworks out of the way. <clears throat> um, giving out of our wealth is a mark of every true Christ follower. Every true Christ follower is marked by generosity and giving. There is no such thing as a non-generous, non-giving Christ follower. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't happen. If God has blessed you with the opportunity to be to have your sins, the penalty and the power of it removed, and given you the grace of life and deposited his Holy Spirit within you, and it didn't transform your understanding of money, you have to question whether you're a Christ follower or not, right? You just have to. Giving out of your wealth is the mark of a Christ follower. And then finally, one of the rules that we have is that money is not to be loved, right? Money's an object. It, it becomes an idol if we're not careful. So money's not to be loved. And this is what Paul is saying here to Timothy. And so... <clears throat> Here's where we are, and now having said all of that, let's just look at this text and break it down and see what we can find out of it. But godliness, now this is in contrast, verse 6, in contrast to the fact that there, there are people who think that godliness is a means of financial gain, right? So they're thinking, okay, if I, if I, if I jump through God's hoops and I do what God says, money cometh, right? Um, and there was a church in our area years ago that had all their whole congregation, uh, you know, hold the hand up and like pull down a lever on a, on a slot machine, you know, money cometh. And the whole congregation is in there doing this money cometh thing. It's, it's a mockery. It's a silly, I even hate to call it a church. It's a sham. It's a mockery of the things of God. That's not who we are. And so he says, but godliness, right now. So he's saying, Hey, listen, Godliness isn't going to lead you into financial gain. If that's what you're thinking is going to happen, it's not. But godliness with contentment, now that's some gain. And so his, his contrast is not the chasing of money, but the contentment wherewith God has given you the resources that you need to live this life, right? So it comes down to contentment. And so this is the issue. This is his overarching statement. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to experience real, true gain in life? It's not chasing money. It's finding contentment where you are in this station of life. Mon money's not a measure of godliness, right? It, it, and again, I'm going to go back to this in American culture and everywhere else. You know, oh, I'm just blessed. I'm just blessed. Well, sometimes I think you're cursed. Because if I see the lifestyle that you're living, you got all this money, and there is this love of God, but it has totally distracted and derailed you from everything else. And you are, in a sense, from those outside looking in, are in bondage to this stuff. Um, you should understand that's not a measure of godliness. Uh, contentment 
is the measure of godliness. How content with you, with with life, are you? Now, contentment is not the same as as uh, having an attitude of mediocrity, right? Um, contentment doesn't mean that you that you want no more. Uh, that there's no drive in your life anymore. You're just going to sit around in the dirt and, and just love God. That's what the desert fathers kind of thought would happen. Just escape. Uh, that that's not, that's not it. There's, there's nothing wrong with moving forward in our progression of life, but the pursuit of money in that means that there is this lack of contentment. Now I don't, and look, we all, we all have to have money to, to eat, to drive, to put fuel in cars, right? We have to have that. If a man won't work, neither let him eat. There's this thing. Make it your ambition, Paul says, lead a quiet life. Work with your hands, right? Uh, so there is this concept of work and why we go to work. Uh, but the, the goal of work isn't to just see how many toys we can amass, right? All the Proverbs that Jesus spoke about that deal with that, I don't want to have to rehash. There's a man with the bigger barns, right? There's all of those, those concepts of, of money. Uh, he is most rich, I think is true, who desires really nothing. I mean, this is kind of where it comes down to. With food and shelter, we will be content, right? This is what he says. Uh, verse, uh, well, verse seven, he says, let, let's look, let's look at, the, at, the, at the text so we can stay in line with it. Um, you, you already have enough. Can, can you say that? Can you say right now today, I already have enough, right? I already have enough. I mean, you, you look around. Are, do, do you, are you lacking for anything? Now, some of you may be. I'm not. I'm not saying that maybe, you know, you're, there's some food that 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 you need or whatever. But but most of us have all eaten, right? Um, you know, we we do that. We 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 don't lack. I'm I'm looking over on my uh my coffee bar. I've got like a ten pound bag of rice and a ten pound bag of, of beans or whatever. That's kind of our prepper preparation thing, if you will. I've just got that there. So uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go hungry. I've got, if, if somebody needs some, something, I can make some rice and beans, right? This is what we're talking about. Do, do I already have enough or do, do I need a new car? See, how, how do we justify those? Do I need a new shirt? Do I need, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong again with doing that, but let's just analyze and, and cha challenge our, our perception to these things. So here's some principles that Paul lays down. Verse eight, uh, verse six, we've already looked at. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Man, the best place to be in life is when you are pursuing God and you're fully satisfied with whatever is happening in your world right now. Man, that is a blessing. When, when you can say, thank you, Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When that is your station in life, there is no better station to be. So he says, that's the goal. Now, then he says this, we brought nothing into this world. We're taking nothing out, right? You know, the old, you know, uh, old illustration, you never see a hearse behind a, behind a, uh, I mean, you never see a, a, a trailer behind a hearse, right? You know, U-Haul, you never see that. You never see those things. Uh, this is all temporal. My, my, my computer, my cup of coffee, my, the books I write in, my car, all of those things are, are temporal with it. It on a blip, it, on a radar. I used to have this rope. It was long, repelling rope. And on the end of it, I, I wrapped a piece of red tape. And that red tape represented our life here on earth because all the rest of it is eternity, which goes on forever. And so you think we're, we're expensing, in, expending a lot of energy right here, chasing stuff that when the Lord comes for us or when we perish, we don't see it ever again. And so why would we spend that much energy of the 70 to 80 years of life that we have chasing something that we can't that won't satisfy and we can't hold on to long term, right? So this is his point. Listen, money's temporal. Don't go crazy chasing. You 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 amass it and, and Solomon, who was by far the wealthiest man ever said, I, I realized that I look at this guy who has nothing. I look at what I have, and he seems more happy than I do. And when I die, all this stuff I, I, I built up is going to go to people who don't appreciate it or didn't earn it, right? And so that that's what's going to happen. So we should at least understand that it's temporal. That's why Jesus says, hey, make your investment in the kingdom, which is not. There, there's no moth and corruption. Quit trying to invest in, in this life. Invest, take your resources and invest in the one to come. Right. And so this is this is the first principle. Number eight, our verse eight says, 
But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. <clears throat> Money will distract us from a simple life. Just let that sink in for a minute. Kind of say that and mull that over in your head. Money will distract us from a simple life, right? Think about it. You see these pictures that come up on social media and you got all these things. You know, you can choose the mansion, you can choose the cabin in the woods. How many people choose the cabin in the woods over the mountain, over the, over the mansion? Why is that? There's something innate in us that says, man, I want to chase all that, but there's something refreshing about just, nope, I got that cabin, I'm in the woods, maybe I got a cup of coffee and I've got a fire and I'm looking at these gorgeous mountains like, like we have in my area, neck of the woods, and the colors are changing, right? It's that, right? It's the simple choices that, that we make in life, right? I mean... How many, you know, sometimes I hear people, they will say, well, man, you give me a steak or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I'd rather have that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Isn't that interesting? There's something, we were chatting about food the other day uh, at, at the office and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I was just talking about uh, butter beans and what we had growing up, you know, and, and there's something nostalgic about that, uh, about the rice and beans, which we, that was one of our weekly meals was rice and beans. Um, and then sometimes we had butter beans with bread and then sometimes we got some meat with it, but those were kind of the staple meals growing up. But isn't there something that draws us to that on occasion? Just the simplicity of that. My friend Saji, uh, who, who I deeply appreciate, uh, is a, is a man from India, <clears throat> uh, Kerala, a, a, a kind of a wealthier place in, in, in India. But when he fell in love with Christ, uh, he really has abandoned the, the riches of this world. He, um, man, he, he wants, he, he, when, when he comes to town, he don't want to rent a car because he thinks about how much money that can, that rental car will, will care for people in, in India. He, everything he does is about how, if, if I, but if I don't spend that dollar going out to eat here and I send it to India, it's going to feed, you know, 10 kids for this many days. And, and his thought process is vastly different from the majority of the people of which I come in contact with. And I'm drawn to someone like that. There's something about the simple things. And this is, this is what Paul is saying here in verse eight. But if we have food and clothing with that, we're going to be content. Those who want to get rich. Now, this is a warning to those of us who are trying to, to, get, to get wealthy, right? And this is convicting stuff. To those who want to get rich, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, right? When you and I decide that we want more money and we're going to pursue more money, don't think that it won't come without a price, it will. There's a price to be paid. Ruin and destruction, he says. When you think about it, let, th think, think about this. The, 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 some of the counseling things that I deal with and some of the people that I, that I come in contact with have strife because uh, between parent and child, adult adults and their adult parents, because the mom and dad were so busy chasing money, trying to provide for their family that they neglected the relationship. Ruin and destruction. You see that? Listen, you can get so busy trying to chase money and think you're doing a noble thing because that's the other thing that money does. It deceives us. It's a trap, he says, that we chase it so much that the things that really matter in this life go away. I used to work in a geri with a geriatric psychiatrist and I would do therapy um, for, for him in some of the, the, area, the uh, assisted living and, and nursing homes and things like that. Never once did I have conversations about people, uh, you know, uh, wishing they had had more time to work and, and do something else. Most of them, it's about relationships. Lot, the thing about Christ is it comes down to relationships. But think about the ruin that happens. And you, have, you need to get your own list out. But, but how many relationships have been, have been jeopardized because you were chasing money? How many families and, and, and your, your perspective of your relationships have shifted because of that? How much joy was stolen from you because you were so worried about paying bills because you let money drive you? And you, and you couldn't sleep because you were concerned about collapse and all of that. How much time was taken away uh, from your life? Valuable time that you'd never get back because you were chasing money. How much peace? 
was lost, right? These are the things that, that we have to think about. And this is what Paul's saying. Man, come on, he says, look, there's a lot more to this than money. And then he comes down to the last one in verse 10. He says, for the love of money is a root. Please don't say the root. It's not the root. It is a root of all kinds. It is a door. Once you open that door and begin to say, okay, money is what I'm going to choose to love and invite into my life. That door, behind that door, is all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered even away from the faith and pierced themselves with many grief. When you start chasing money, you're going to find yourself having a tendency to need to lie about something, to need to, to steal from other people things. You're going, to, you're going to move and you're going to begin to be a hypocritical individual because you want to keep, you, you want to do this, but you don't want to be perceived as that. And so you, you live a life of hypocrisy. You're self-deceived. You convince yourself that all this stuff is for somebody else, and it's really just about your own gratification. Um, you, you distraction. Uh, you replace God with these things. Now we could talk about this forever, but this is. I'm just trying to give us an understanding of where Paul is in the scheme of these things. So, hey, this week evaluate what's going on in your life about that. Don't fall into that trap. Lord bless you guys. Have a great weekend. And Lord willing, I'm going to see you uh, Monday.